Bodhisat Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami everybody. Um, so I'll give some reflections for about 25 minutes or half an hour, and then we'll switch over to question and answers. Um, Tanisabo is currently teaching a retreat in Spokane, but we'll be back next week. Another manifestation of impermanence. Um, yeah, so people may have caught on that uh, the theme for today is perception. And this fits into our whole month's discussion or our, our month's theme of the five aggregates, uh, which are basically uh, a Buddhist framework for what it feels like to have this identity of, of me and mine. And those five things are form, so the physical body, You've got feeling, whether it's pleasant, painful, or neutral. Then you've got the third aggregate, which is perception, or sanya. Then you've got uh, mental formation, or sankhara. And the fifth aggregate is consciousness, vijnana. And these mental aggregates, the mental aspects of our experience, uh, feeling, perception, mental formation, and consciousness, they're rather mixed up. Um, it's not, you can't uh, disjoin them. They are conjoined in different ways. So uh, perception, the Buddha defined in its most simple as basically uh, the naming or the labeling or the designation, uh, the perception, the apperception of he uses examples of color. So this is blue, this is red, uh, this is green, and that is one function of, of perception when we see the world around us, um, the colors that we're able to label uh, and name, the people who we're able to look at and know who they are. Uh, these are all manifestations or aspects of perception. Um, but there's also more complex levels of perception. Uh, for instance, what we're looking at during that meditation is the perception of impermanence, that things are constantly changing. Uh, that's something which most people are not paying attention to. It's, it's manifesting in every aspect of our existence um, all the time, but we just don't notice it because uh, it's kind of weird. You know, people don't, you know, you kind of lose language when you, um, you certainly lose nouns um, when you see the, the change of things. Um, but it can be useful uh, to actually learn how to use these different aggregates as a path to liberation. So that's what um, the Buddha's path really is. That's what the Dhamma is. It's uh, a way to use these raw uh, aggregates, these raw aspects of human experience that we all have but then to relate to them in a skillful and intelligent and more accurate way, uh, such that we uh, learn how to let go more and more and uh, eventually let go of all the uh, unhelpful, unwholesome attachments that we have, which then leads to more and more, greater and greater, deeper and deeper peace and, and happiness. Um, there's a book, which I learned about recently, uh, called An Immense World by Ed Yong. Ed Yong, I think. Um, but it's a fascinating book, basically looking at the perceptual world of different animals, of the animal kingdom. And it's fascinating because looking at what scientists have figured out how animals perceive the world, it's 
very different from how we perceive the world um, in every aspect, in all of the, the senses. So we've got uh, sense perception of the eye, visual perception, we've got auditory perception, we've got olfactory perception or the perception of smells, uh, odors, aromas, you've got uh, perceptions of taste or gustation, perceptions of touch, tactition, and then perceptions of mind or ideation. And um, yeah, animals relate to these different uh, perceptual worlds, these spheres, as they're called in a Buddhist context, in different ways. Like uh, most animals apparently uh, see more of the light spectrum than we do, or a different swath of the visual uh, color, uh, color band. So humans cannot see ultraviolet light, whereas most animals can. So uh, a fish, we just look at, we see uh, certain types of fish and they all look the same to us. Whereas looking at them, if you have, if you can perceive ultraviolet light, then you can see that there are actually all sorts of patterns on their face. It's like, like running mascara or something on their face. Uh, or on flowers, if you have you know, a being, um, most insects um, uh, can see on a flower, it's not just, we just see, say, a sunflower, it's just this yellow and black, um, yellow and black flower. Whereas if you can see the ultraviolet range, you see that there are all sorts of patterns. There are arrows and like bullseyes all over this. And that for uh, the insects that can see this, it then they're able to you know, navigate to those things more and more. And uh, yeah, similarly with uh, sound, like bats and dolphins have echolocation and they can actually almost see with their ears, which is something that we can't do. Um, similarly, there are, I think, uh, songbirds and sea tortoise can actually tap into the magnetic, electromagnetic fields of the earth so they know which direction is, is north or south. Um, so these are fascinating. And this just proves that there's a lot of the world that we're not sensing and not being able to, to tap into. And that's fascinating, but that's the world of, of animals. Um, and I, I do recommend the book just to kind of shake up your own, like we think things are like this, but that's not the whole story. It's a very, very small portion of the story. But what the Pali Canon, or Buddhist scriptures do, and yet probably uh, scriptures of many different religious traditions, um, but specifically in a Buddhist context, we're not just seeing a bigger spectrum outside, you know, as this book is showing us the animal, the animal perception, perceptions of different animals. In the Pali Canon, we get the perceptions of an arahat. We get a picture or a portrait of what it would be like to see the world through a mind that has no greed, anger, and delusion. And that is fascinating. That is fascinating. The, uh, the arhats, that's someone who has completely let go of all unwholesome clinging, un all unwholesome uh, desire, and is just able to see things as they are rather than through the constant uh, lens and um, what's called in Pali, the vipalasa, or like perversions of perception. So sanya vipalasa, these perversions are like the tweaks of perception, which uh, color, literally color the way that we, uh, we see the world. So um, it can be very interesting to, to read these scriptures and, and think, like, oh, wow, someone could see the world and you know, see the same instance. So uh, this can just be a great thought experiment. And um, you know, when we, many Westerners first come to Buddhism, we go to a meditation retreat and we learn a method. Okay, pay attention to the breath at the tip of the nose uh, for seven days. Um, and that's great. Learning how to like focus the mind in that way can be, uh, it's a really wonderful skill, learning how to concentrate the mind. But the Buddha taught many, many different skillful means and learning how to be able to be more flexible with our perceptions is one of the, the tools in the, the Buddhist tool belt, the Buddhist uh, toolbox. So next time we're angry or annoyed, um, say you really like doing sitting meditation without any guided meditation. Some people hate guided meditations. And if you're one of those people, and it's easy for you to notice when 
somebody is talking at you, you hate it. Yeah. Uh, or if you're at your job and your boss does something which is just totally egregious or not even egregious, but you just don't like it. Um, you know, this, these perceptions of anger come up and that's not the full story. That might not even be any, you know, that it's certainly not the full story, but it might even be a totally skewed, inaccurate story that you're telling yourself. And just to imagine, okay, just as, you know, if you're in the office with your boss who's yelling at you, uh, or you're, yeah, let's use that example. You're in your office, your boss is yelling to you, just as if there was uh, a cat or an insect in that room, they would be seeing things that you don't see. Insects would be seeing the ultraviolet light. The cats, if they were lying on the ground, would be feeling the vibrations of the floor. Similarly, if you were an arhant, if I was an arhant, someone who had uh, basically no attachment and didn't uh, love my own and wasn't addicted to uh, fault finding and um, craving aversion, delusion, then I'd be able to see this situation. Okay, my boss is yelling at me, but actually that's, it's just sound. On one level, it's just sound. And an arhant, an enlightened being would be able to shift out of the, the unwholesome and relate to perception in a much more freeing way. So that's what we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, emulate the arhats, basically uh, act as if, and see if we can tune in to that wavelength that, uh, that enlightened beings are, are tuned into all the time. So one very helpful perception for this, uh, this path is one which you find it's a very, very short little discourse the Buddha gave. Um, you could memorize it right now. Um, but basically, it's at the heart of Buddhist right view, samaditi. And that is, it is possible to abandon the unwholesome. That's one. And it is possible to develop the wholesome. That's the kernel. That's the heart of faith in Buddhism. Okay, forget about you know, bowing to whatever kind of deity or, you know, all these things, which, um, you know, is easy to find, find fault with. The heart of Buddhist right view is it is possible to abandon the unwholesome, unhealthy, unproductive mental states, and it is possible to develop more patience and loving kindness and friendliness and uh, seeing clearly and non-attachment. Um, and just that belief, that is a perception. Yeah, that's a belief. Uh, the perception is possible, possible. And you can bring in that perception to the next time you're experiencing unhealthful, unwholesome mental states, possible, okay? And that can be the kernel or the seed for this whole concept of it is possible to abandon the unwholesome. It is possible to develop the wholesome, possible. And similarly, when you tune into this, uh, the auditory field, the ears tune into that not a sound, the sound of silence, that can be a symbol, that can be a label, that can be uh, a perceptual um, sticker for this whole perception of impermanence. So anytime I hear the, this hum in the background, impermanence, change, we can yoke those two, um, that mental concept of change, impermanence, and the auditory perception of the sound of silence and make them one and the same. Uh, and that can help us to, to see things more clearly because uh, what's, all the, what's all the fuss about impermanence? Why some people might be like, okay, yeah, it's permanent, but uh, not so exciting. Um, but the Buddha really pointed to this along with the perception of not self and the perception of unsatisfactoriness because these are the things when we perceive the world as permanent, you are Xander, you are Rahul, I am Ajahn, you know, uh, and I am permanent. I am always going to be like this. Um, when we impute self and permanence on things which are not self and are not permanent, then we are going to, we're going to suffer when those things change and they do change, everything changes. Um, and don't take my word for it. You can do a, take it as a, a working hypothesis. If you find anything that's permanent, great. Write it down and uh, let us know next week. We might test you.
don't know if it's still the same, but um, uh, yeah, we can see impermanence. This uh, when we close our eyes, uh, the Buddha and monks have been doing this these experiments, seeing impermanence, knowing impermanence. Um, yeah, for twenty five hundred years, but. You don't have to be Buddhist to notice the impermanence of the visual field. Um, the, there's a whole, there have been people um, like Western uh, scientists studying these different realms and these different aspects of, of truth and experience for uh, many, for hundreds of years now as well. There, is, uh, there were scientists in the 1800s who really went deep dive into this visual field of impermanence and came up with a number of really neat words for experiences which we all know, but which uh, we don't yet have a name for in English. So you close your eyes and everything is not black, especially if you're not in a pitch black room. But even if you are in a room that has uh, no light, your visual field is not black. Uh, the German word for this is eigengrau, eigengrau, which means, uh, which means personal grayness. You've got this, it's, this is the color of personal grayness, and that's the, the black that you see, and it's, it's a gray or a black that is constantly changing. And a complementary word is eigenlichter, which is this uh, personal light. So the light that you see, yeah, the, the grayness or the, the more lightness of that black. And then you've got the word phosphine, which is the color, the plays of color. Um, so having a name for this uh, can help you bring your mind back to it. And being able to see and hear impermanence in, in this way can be a great tool uh, to put into your Buddhist tool belt, because it's not always easy to come back to the breath. If you're in a conversation with someone, you know, you can notice when you're not speaking, okay, I'm, I'm breathing, but you can also pay attention to the sound of silence, the sound of impermanence. And uh, when you get more comfortable with that, it can almost be like a, yeah, it becomes a friend. And you've got this friend talking to you all the time, just reminding you of the, uh, the truth of impermanence. And that can be really reassuring, especially if you're in a situation which is uh, unfamiliar to you. And um, yeah, just this constant whisper of hmm, not sure, impermanent, impermanent. And you can really just experiment in this way. So these are all um, different types of, uh, of perception, ways to use perception as a building block, as a, a map, as uh, tools to work towards work towards uh, towards nibbana, towards freedom from freedom from suffering. Um, I mentioned this sanya vipalasa, the perversions of uh, of perception, and this is what an arhat has completely seen through. So whereas. Uh, people who are not yet enlightened, maybe most of us, most of the time, uh, we're seeing, rather than seeing the impermanence of the world, we're seeing the permanence. Rather than seeing the unsatisfactoriness that things do change, we're seeing all the pleasure and we, we're attaching onto that. Instead of seeing the uh, not self nature of things, we're seeing self, we're imputing self around the world. Um, and rather than seeing that which is unbeautiful, like all those things which, um, yeah, the, the flaws of the world, we're just obsessed with looking at, looking at beauty, like eyes like to see that which is beautiful, and uh, we gravitate to that, and we forget everything which is, uh, yeah, giving us reminders of things which, yeah, everything isn't, the world isn't pretty all the time, and uh, an arhat just sees through these things, but what an enlightened being can do is this is what's called the uh, the powers of a uh, an arahant is that when they want to they can see beauty 
in things which are ugly, things which are unattractive, or they can see unattractive nature aspects of things which are otherwise attractive, or they can see both the attractive and the unattractive at the same time, or they can just abide paying attention to neither of these things. And uh, yeah, that's just another uh, skill. You know, it's not like, you know, this is just a, a power or something which once someone attains our hardship, then bing, you've got it and you've got nothing before. You can't, you know, you can't be flexible with your perceptions up until you become an arhat. You know, this is something you can can practice with and we can all practice with it. And yeah, just becoming um, yeah, more flexible, more skillful, um, and just more conscious of the way that we use this third uh, third aggregate of perception or san, sanya uh, and really make it make it part of the path um, yeah that's just some some reflections on um, how to take perception and and use it for for benefit and maybe now we can open things up to questions and comments if anyone has as thoughts. Do we get the the wireless microphones working? We can pass these around if anybody wanted to share. All right, that's a primary. It's working. Just curious, um, maybe a show of hands. Uh, apparently not everyone can hear that, that sound of silence, that ringing. Um, maybe just a show of hands of people who, when we were going through that part of the guided meditation, or if you tune your mind to it right now, or if things are quiet, how many people can actually hear this kind of pitch going in the background? All right. most. Most people. Oh, please, Moffat. a really good point and something I look at as well. I mean, you know, impermanence, the perception of impermanence can give both um, commitment and composure. Yeah, so, um, you know, although things, this is a fairly uh, big week, you know, law-wise in America, um, and depending on what side somebody's on, on any of these issues, you could see it as a, uh, a good thing or a bad thing. And if, in, in, and when it seems like things are falling apart, like seeing the uh, falling apart, the dissolution side of, of impermanence, um, we, that is true.
But another aspect of impermanence that you can pay attention to um, is that ruling, whichever it may be, is also impermanent. You know, it's uh, with whatever political issue it is, that political party is not going to stay in power forever. You know, so that's actually, um, that can give composure. Yeah, so, um, and if that wasn't true, if impermanence wasn't true, then all of these rulings would just be permanent. And that would be depressing for whichever, you know, side of anything that we're, we're on. Um, so yeah, focusing on the other, like the flip side of that impermanent perception. Um, and yeah, finding the truth of that. And um, in this, this realm of perception, you know, tuning into like the fear, like fear is a perception, yeah? But it's just one perception and it's not self either. So a, a good exercise when one's feeling like fear come up in the body is to be able to locate it and say, okay, that this, yeah, the tension in one's shoulders or the tension in one's face, uh, that's somehow related. It's a very mammalian fear response, you know, to, to tense up like that. Um, but there's also truths, there are also truths which there is a truth of non-danger. Yeah, there's, there are aspects of the world and the existence that are not dangerous, which are not fearful. The Buddha named these like an antaraika sanya, perception, the perception of non-danger. So yeah, I mean, there are dangerous things in the world, but there are also non-dangerous truths in the world. And when you can tune into tune into those, especially in your body, um, that can help you relax out and tune in. It's just a shift of focus, you know, because we have this habit of, it could be a fear habit, you know, in, in a brain, you know, limbic system, just the, the flight, you know, we, uh, this challenging situation came up and the brain is telling us to run um, or to fight. Um, but the limbic system isn't the whole brain. The tension in our shoulders isn't the whole body. The tiny perception of um, ruination is not the only perception that exists in the mind. And, and realizing that and then having that openness and then that, that kind of kernel like of possibility, it is possible to, to develop the wholesome and, and to abandon the unwholesome. And that's true both on a personal level. So I can, I can let go of the fear that's coming up. You know, I'm encountering someone who is, who's very challenging, or I've just learned this piece of news, which is uh, deeply depressing, but it is possible to, that depression is not uh, the whole truth. And um, it's actually not, not helpful. It's true but it's not helpful. So not trying to like smack it away, but just realize there are other things, you know, not, you know, you know, moving our attention wildly and aversively away from these other truths, but just realizing, okay, there are other truths out there and paying attention to those are actually more healthful, like body and mind for going forward. Did that, how does that, how does that sound? Thank you for that If anyone didn't hear that, uh, Gary was just talking about the, an image of a yin-yang symbol with a little bit of white in the black area and a little bit of black in the white area. Um, and I think the point that you're, you're pointing to is kind of the, um, when you're right on the edge of that white circle, you know, going in the black sphere, the 
edge of the black circle in the, the white uh, shape. Um, that can feel porous and it and it it is like there is you know when you zoom in you know on any um yin and yang symbol you know on paper there's going to be you zoom in far enough and you're going to see gray you know between the black and the white or like an image of uh, a shadow like a light shadow cast by light it's not just the dark one clear definitive shadow not shadow there's what's called like the penumbra or the the edge, this kind of uh, edge of a shadow, um, which is is the gray area, and and when you're in that gray area, that's that's a great place to be because that can be almost like the place of that can be your fulcrum of of choice, like whether you want to see the black or see the white or see the gray. Is that yeah, cool image? Thanks, Gary. Yeah, I had a question. Um, uh, well, also testing this. So you've taught a few different meditations in the past few weeks. And I was wondering if, how does one go about finding a balance between spreading yourself thin, trying different things all the time, mm -hmm. versus having a certain core toolkit that you deepen in? Yeah. It's a good question about, um, yeah, how do you not spread one your, yourself too thin with meditation techniques? Uh, there's one meditation teacher who gives the analogy of like digging a hole. Yeah, so uh, if you're digging a hole, say that's your breath meditation, um, you should just practice that breath meditation because you know, you're digging your breath meditation hole. And if you keep with the, the breath at that point, then eventually you're going to get to the gold. You're going to get to the groundwater. Um, but if you're, okay, I'm going to play with the breath here, dig this hole over here, but actually I'm going to listen to the nada sound over here. Um, and you're just digging a hole here, a hole there. You're never going deep enough to get to any gold or get to any water. And it's an interesting simile. Uh, I actually found it a frightening simile, and it kind of kept me from, um, yeah, it can, it can be a useful perception, um, but it can also be useful to zoom into like the hole that we're digging, the Pali Canon, you know, even the Buddhist teachings to one person, one monk, one lay person, he wouldn't just say, okay, breath meditation on the tip of the nose is always right for you. That's your meditation object. Like the uh, Ambala Rahula Wadaka Sutta Majima number 70, he's teaching his son. And he gives his son in one discourse, like eight different objects of meditation, including meditation on the breath and meditation on earth, water, wind, air, perception of not self. Um, and all of that, we can conceive of it more than just like, I'm digging a small hole over here with the breath at the nose, and I'm digging another hole over here when I pay attention to um, uh, the nada sound or this uh, phosphine behind the eyes, but we're digging, a we're digging a big hole. Like our hole is impermanence, the three characteristics. You know, all of that is within the, the Buddhist teaching and we're chipping away. It's like if you're actually digging a hole in the ground, you know, even just a shovel size, it's not that you just constantly aim your pointed shovel like at the center of the hole. No, you sometimes you go at the edge of the, the hole to break down that side and then you move it over on this side of the hole, and then you do it in the back. And that's how, that's what I feel like if, if you're bringing um, meditation and, you know, Buddhist practice, the Buddhist teachings into your whole life, into your whole day, not just, um, yeah, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, an hour or whatever. If you're trying to live the Dhamma, you're going to want a big hole, <laughs> you're going to want a big hole. Because, um, because things change. And yeah, the breath at the tip of the nose might be a great tool and go deep with it, go as deep as you can, especially if you're getting really good results and are experiencing bliss and piti and sukha and uh, all these other things keep going. But what happens when you, know, you get pneumonia and you actually can't breathe through your nose or um, yeah, something just changes, you get you know, some overwhelming 
perception comes up in your life, some huge thing changes, and you might just be, if you've only been digging that very deep hole, but not kind of digging out the surrounding area, then, um, yeah, you, it's, you might not know where to go. So kind of working, just a big, it's a bigger hole. Yeah. So is that, what do you, what do you think? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> John, are there questions on Zoom? Is that possible? The reason that, uh, so Steve, um, this gentleman sitting over here, he kind of adopted this system from um, SIMS, the Seattle Insight Meditation, and they've got this kind of setup set up so that people can um, Zoom in and also come in in person. So if uh, someone is too far away or if they're sick, um, they can use this setup. So we're hoping to kind of create a seamless boundary, but it's our first day, so. Okay. And it's good not to use uh, any of these perceptions as like a cudgel to beat yourself over the head. You know, if our, um, yeah, our loved one is being really frustrating um, and we realize that, yeah, if an arhat were me, then I wouldn't be angry, but I'm not an arhat, so um, this is what it's like. Um, you know, rather than just like, you know, saying I should like, it's a little bit of a coarse expression, but like instead of shooting all over yourself, basically, um, yeah, not doing that, realizing this is this is one truth, this is an aspect. I I don't seem to be able to let go right now, and um, that's that's as far as you can go, and just realizing that that boundary and and respecting it, but still holding out that that possibility for for a different perception. That's really really important because. Perception's not self. You can't just force, I can't force myself to see the whole world is red. Um, I can't think myself to out of uh, aversion every time. So, yeah, let's do that. Grace, you wanna? Grace, can you hear us? Yeah. Similar to what you had already asked, but can you say a few words on skillfully changing perception from fear to love without forcing aversion or anxiety or aversion? Hmm. So that was. What's that? Give, give her another aspirin, try talking. Again. Can you try saying it again, Grace? Unmuting and. No. Okay. Yeah, how to shift from fear to to love and um this is one of the benefits of like formal meditation um you know in one sense we're with our mind it's the same mind in one way when we're sitting on the cushion as when we're going about our daily life so there is a school of of thought even of buddhist thought that says then why sit meditation you know just 
the real world, you know, you're, uh, the real world is the real world and impermanence is impermanent and not self is not self, whether you've got your eyes closed or, or open. So why sit meditation? Um, but one thing we're doing when we uh, practice formal meditation, doing it for a specific amount of time in a, in a specific way, um, whatever that is, just being really intentional about that for a period of time is that we, we train and you can like learn more about your own practice of these things, like uh, intentional practice of loving kindness. You can learn to, to yoke. So this is a, it's the English word is related to the Pali and Sanskrit word yoga, which you find both in uh, Hindu texts, in the Vedas and in Buddhist texts, yoga. You, you yoke the feeling of metta to somewhere in the body. And, you know, people from many different religious traditions talk, have talked about yoking that feeling of metta, of loving kindness, to the heart center, so to the, the center of the chest. And when you practice that intently, when you practice that uh, intentionally uh, for five minutes every morning, 20 minutes every morning, then you've got more of a a channel to tune into. It's like, um, you know, maybe people, I'm old enough to know this, um, but like in an old fashioned TV or radio, I think radios are still like this, but basically you're like tuning the radio and you uh, are trying to find your, your station, you know, and if you have just moved to a place or you're visiting someplace, you don't know what every station is, but you like kind of slowly go through the, the dial and then you've Think, oh, yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of a yeah, Christian gospel, and okay, okay, there's a, going up the spectrum. Okay, good. There's some rock and whatever. You find what you want, and then you can kind of tune it in. Whereas when you've been practicing intently with loving kindness in the body, uh, or yoked to a specific word, or yoked to the nada sound, or yoked to uh, the perception of red when you close your eyes you can, the mind can do all these things because really it's the mind that is doing all of these things. And you can combine these. And when you've got more and more uh, cues, more and more handles for metta, then when fear comes up, which is a very shaky uh, mind state, then you've got your, your handholds. You know where the handholds are. It's like you've been going to a climbing gym. And even if you're a great climber, if it's your first time going to a climbing gym, first time going to a wall, you don't know the you don't know where all the handholds and footholds are. Whereas if you've been practicing on that, going to that same climbing gym every day, you know where the handholds are. Okay, here, I'm gonna feel my sensations in my heart. Okay, the, the world is shaking, the climbing wall is shaking, there's an earthquake, but okay, I can probably don't wanna climb a climbing wall during an earthquake, but, but at any rate, okay, hold on to the feeling at the center of the chest, hold on to the nada sound, hold on to the feeling of red, hold on to this mantra of uh, may you be happy, may I be happy. And then you've just got multiple, it's like you're on, on the sea and you've got different kind of like buoys around you. You've got like inflated uh, inner tubes. You've got multiple of them. And if one of them slips off, don't worry, you've got like more inner tubes to hold yourself up. And that's like, you know, fear is trying to, you know, shake you away and you can drown in it. Whereas if you've got these different things you've been practicing with. I know where metta is in my body. Uh, I know what metta sounds like for me. Then yeah, you can tune into that. You can tune into that, that radio signal and uh, you know exactly where it is and you can just go right to it. And then as happens, especially with old, like, you know, bad radios, like sometimes they'll just, I don't know if this actually happens, but, but you can imagine a radio that was so bad that the tuner just constantly was falling off of your station, but you can constantly tweak it back, yeah, and bring it back in tune. Okay, loving kindness, not fear. Okay, I don't need, I don't want to tune into the fear. Um, so yeah. Well, should we? Uh, if we didn't have any more questions, maybe we can. Oh, hey. My question is, uh, what do you have any pro tips around 
what to do when you have doubt around the truth of the experience. Like you have a sense like this is probably the truth, but there's sort of a lot you're experiencing maybe doubt that um, your perception might be wrong. Can you be more specific like or just keeping it like that? Um, hmm. So I guess sort of further discernment against sort of like, you know, the, the nature of the multiple voices of like, is this the ego or is mm. this like your Buddha voice? And you're pretty sure that it's probably the ego, but like, you're like, well, maybe it's not. <laughs> Do you have a good kind of like pro tip around how to discern? Yeah, I like that pro tip. <laughs> uh, I have, yeah. Being around monasteries, you do get to work with a lot of doubt. So, um, uh, I mean, there are, th you know, the Buddha said in the Kalama Sutta, there are things which are worthy of doubt, and it's good to doubt those things. But, you know, if you're doing something which feels broadly wholesome, um, and then there's just this crippling doubt or this crippling kind of, we called it, yeah, the analysis paralysis, you're just stuck and you can't think your way out of it, like shifting, shifting your focus, maybe to your, to your body, maybe to the soles of your feet or to your, to your hands. And um, just kind of waiting for that doubt wave because doubt waves are like huge. It's like you're at um, Maui, I don't know, um, somewhere with big waves and uh, that's, that's doubt. But like, you know, wherever you are and whatever the waves are like, they do calm, you know, so just, I think that's really the come to come to some place that you don't have to doubt about, like the feeling of your hands or the feeling of your feet. That's the present moment. That is true. You know, that's that's pretty true. Or coming to something else, like I, you know, I do feel love for X or whatever. That's that feels very fundamental. So just coming to a deeper ground, which is not conceptual. Um, can just in that those big waves of doubt will subside over time and just so resting in a more foundational place if that makes sense yeah cool cool oh Kyle question was uh, personal experience with Samadhi um, yeah Samadhi is a a range so it means, um, yeah, uh, how Ajahn Pasano phrases it. It's often translated as concentration, which gives you one field. That's a perception. Like names for things are perceptions. So calling it concentration is one thing, which elicits in many people's minds a very one-pointed focus, one focus. Um, whereas Ajahn Pasano translates samadhi as firm establishment of mind. Kwam tang jai man firm establishment of mind and yeah i mean i haven't you know it, it's a spectrum so i haven't had the deepest um forms of of meditation but yeah i mean it's it's interesting like answering this question certainly like in a group setting one of the so monks have two rules about speaking about their own personal meditation practice uh, one of them is that uh, a monk cannot even tell the truth about their um, meditational, like deep meditational practices. Um, that's one type of fits. But if a monk lies about their deep meditational experiences, that is a parajika. That monk is no longer a monk. Yeah. So if, and so just Ajahn Pasano is given, the, or Ajahn Jayasaro is given the advice, certainly in group settings. Um, to just not so much talk about one's own practice because within the that rule itself it says you know it's not totally an offense if one just overestimates oneself but you don't want to get too close to that um because it, it can be really easy to overestimate oneself especially when different systems even great meditational teachers um utejaniya um a burmese meditation master might have a very different definition of samadhi or of jhana than um uh, say like Paul Oxayadal. So like even great teachers have, of which I'm not 
you know, have like different definitions of, of samadhi. So yeah, I just think we've all hope, I mean, yeah, all of us have had varying levels of like firm establishment of mind and just like more paying attention to and remembering those times and giving weight to it. That's what we're like, that's a big part of the path. Once the Buddha said that the eightfold path can be thought of as right samadhi, sama samadhi, right establishment of mind with its seven accoutrema. So like basically right speech, right action, right view, right livelihood, right, uh, right thought, right effort, right mindfulness, all are coming to support this foundational aspect of mind. So it's like a gradual, gradual path. That was like a long way to get around not answering your question. <laughs> <laughs>